everyone, and welcome to the possibilities of the metaverse. Together, we're going to go on a journey as pioneers on a new frontier in its second act. I'm Nicole Bishop, an uplink top innovator with the World Economic Forum, and the founder and CEO of Cortolio, an AI-powered platform that uncovers then transforms metadata and scientific documents into answers that bring moonshots within reach of innovators around the world. Today, we're joined by a panel of innovators imagining and building this new frontier. I'm sure you're curious, what is the metaverse? Here to answer that question, I'd like to welcome Peggy Johnson, CEO of Magic Leap, a company at the forefront of its possibilities. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so I've been given the daunting task of uh, describing what the metaverse is. <laughs> Um, it's, that's not an, an easy thing to do, actually. I'm the CEO of an augmented reality headset company, and I'm often asked, what, what is the metaverse? And essentially, the metaverse is a blending of your physical and your digital worlds. Um, basically, it's a little frustrating as an augmented reality company um, that oftentimes the current dialogue around the metaverse is centered in virtual reality. So virtual reality is where you might put on a headset and you enter another world. And there's great opportunity for virtual reality. There's entertainment, there's training, there's things like that. Um, but there's also augmented reality where you still see your physical world and you augment it with digital content in front of your eyes. And both are the metaverse, which is why it becomes a little bit confusing. Um, and the way I think of it is this. Uh, if you think about the digital infrastructure of the internet, that's the area that houses all of your data and the services and the applications that you use. And you enter the digital internet through a physical device, whether it's your mobile phone or the PC. The metaverse now will, be, will actually expand upon that and it will be a merging of your digital and your physical worlds. Sometimes you'll be fully virtual. Sometimes, like in this application here, it's a factory. The physical part of this factory is in gray, and the digital part is in purple, and they're blended together, and that creates a whole new experience. Now, it's also important to note that the metaverse is not a singular destination. I think sometimes we come to see that from the media, that it's only one place. That would be like saying the internet is only one web page. Um, but what it's going to be is an interconnected web of networks, much like the digital interface or the digital uh, internet is, but it'll be expanded and it'll create new experiences for all of us. Um, the metaverse is going to be the technological foundation of which we will build the future. It's where I think we'll actually see what's known as Web 3.0 really come to life. And our, when you buy digital assets, you'll be able to take them in and out of the metaverse, actually. And at least the way I see it right now, we are early days in the metaverse. Um, but I grew up in the mobile phone industry, and I think much like the mobile phone industry, much of where the metaverse begins will likely be in business. And we see this already today in businesses that are used to wearing head-worn devices. So doctors who go into surgery might wear magnifiers or lights, and first responders or soldiers might wear helmets. And then in manufacturing, you might have safety glasses. Those seem to be the industries that are adopting this idea of digitally overlaying your physical world initially, and they're, they're the ones who are actually seeing value today. But most importantly, as at the dawn of this new infrastructure, we absolutely must ensure that it remains open and it's fair and accessible for all players, developers, businesses, consumers alike, and, and companies, so that it's not you know, dominated by one, one area of, of our existing digital infrastructure. And then obviously, like with any new technology, we need to ensure that it, our data, our personal data is kept private, secure, and most critically, that it's your data and that you have the ability to access your data anywhere. And I think the opportunity with the metaverse is we've learned quite a bit from uh, what's happened with Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. We know what the pitfalls are. So we have the opportunity to really form this new metaverse in the right way from the beginning. 
And with that, um, I think we'll come back to the panel. Uh, just something to keep in mind, the metaverse is already here. It's useful in some ways, but it's early. And so it's exciting to have you here as we start on this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy. Now I'd like to introduce the rest of this amazing panel. First, we have Hoda Al-Kazami, who is currently a research assistant professor at NYU Abu Dhabi. She has expertise in cryptology, crypto analysis, and constructing trusted security architectures for different environments across a range of products and industries, including digital safety in the metaverse. Thank you for joining us, Hoda. Next, we have Philip Rosedale, founder and CEO of High Fidelity. However, in 1996, he founded Linden Labs and created Second Life, a metaverse that allows people to create avatars of themselves and lead a second life in the virtual world. Thank you for joining us, Philip. Next, uh, we have Peggy, we, we had the fortune to meet, and we'll be hearing more from her shortly. We also have Pascal Kaufman, who is a neuroscientist turned entrepreneur that has been named one of the leading voices in new understanding of intelligence by US Business Journal, Inc. He founded the company StarMind for self-learning knowledge networks. Pascal also launched the MindFire Group to decipher the principles of intelligence and to make that knowledge available to cutting edge research. In addition to an expertise in artificial intelligence, Pascal has expertise in virtual reality, modern philosophy, and innovation management. Thank you so much for joining us. And last but certainly not least, we have Ed Lewin, who is the Vice President, Government and Public Affairs at the Lego Group. There, he's responsible for Lego Group's work with governments and other societal stakeholders to drive the Lego brand purpose, which is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. He is passionate about children's rights and well-being, offline and online, and the role of play in developing critical skills in children and adults. Ed is also a trustee of the UK's Holocaust Educational Trust, a board member of medical advocacy and research charity beyond Celiac, and a governor at his local primary school. Thank you all for joining us today, and uh, the audience and I thank you and welcome you. As many people spend more time building, uh, excuse me, blending offline and online transactions, the metaverse promises to be the virtual meeting space of tomorrow, where communities can work, play, relax, transact, and socialize. How will this digital space transform our lives. First though, we need to understand how do we build the metaverse or build upon uh, what is existing today. So Ed, you're part of a community that supports a community of builders, a company, excuse me, that supports a community of builders as well as children and young adults who will grow up with the metaverse. Can you share your perspective on what's to come as you think about the building blocks of the metaverse? Well, thank you, Nicole, and thank you to the World Economic Forum for having me here today. And in terms of what, are, in terms of what the, the metaverse looks like, I think that's a really hard question to answer at this point, because as Peggy says, we're right at the outset. And it's exciting because we're on the edge of a wave of technological innovation. Technological innovation driven by human ingenuity that relies on imagination. And when we rely on our imagination, we tap into our inner child. And children have the most incredible imagination, unencumbered by a lot of the, the bias, the baggage, the experiences that we all pick up in our lives. And so the future of the metaverse is going to be inspired, is going to be role modeled by our inner child. And at the Lego Group, we find that really inspiring because it's exactly how we work, it's how we create, it's how we play, it's how we innovate. So while I don't know what the future of the metaverse looks like, one thing I am really focused on is that it includes and incorporates very deliberately the perspectives of children as a vulnerable group in our society. And if we don't do that, then some of the mistakes of the past, some of the mistakes of Internet 2.0, where Internet platforms that haven't been designed with children in mind may be repeated. One in three of our Internet users are children and young adults. One in three. That feels like a big enough group to design for. 
And yet too often at the moment when children go online, they're confronted by unsafe experiences or content that is inappropriate for them. So I'd like to ensure that we have a metaverse that is designed with children in mind. When I take my first tentative steps into the metaverse, I, I can bet that my four young children are probably going to be metaverse natives. And I'd like to ensure that for them, that for all the children in all our lives, that the metaverse is one that is safe, that upholds their rights, and that is positive for their well-being. Thank you so much, Ed. And so, Philip, you have a bit of experience at this. What does it take to build the metaverse, uh, build upon what's, what's, what's already existing? What are the building blocks? Thanks. Uh, well, Second Life uh, was, is, is almost 20 years old now, and so the technology of, of the time was quite different. But it did contain the essential building blocks that we needed to, to do what we wanted to do, which was we wanted to create a, a, a place where people came together, in many cases people who hadn't met each other before, and built things together. And so we built building blocks, not, not unlike Legos, but imagine Legos that you can also twist <laughs> into wonderful little shapes and paint on. And uh, we allowed people to create avatars that represented themselves uh, in any way they wanted to, with the presumption, especially at the outset, that they wouldn't want to be themselves necessarily. And so privacy and identity and the way that we allowed you to say who you were was from the very start something that was quite meta. You know, it was, it was very outside the idea of, you know, uh, tr the traditional experience. We also had to build an economy which looks a lot like the cryptocurrency economies in some ways that we have today. We had to build a digital currency so that people that were in two different countries that were using Second Life could, if they wanted to, buy and sell things from each other. And today that economy is $650 million a year of, of, with about a million people using it to buy and sell things from each other. So we've been able to learn a lot in this, I can't believe it, almost 20 years. <laughs> Uh, I, I, was, I was here, I think, in 2008 talking in an open forum about the, about the same thing. It's, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, we learned a lot. We had to build these basic tools that would enable people to come together. I think the thing that was unique about Second Life, maybe as a part of the metaverse, as Peggy said, was that it was and is primarily designed to enable people to be creative and to kind of use that as a tool for coming together, whether for uh, just getting to know each other or for working together or for improving their lives or learning something and that that how we make that work has really been our focus. Thank you so much. And Pascal, you know, we talked a, a bit about imagination and, uh, you know, could you share with us what you imagine the role of AI and data will be in the metaverse? Thanks a lot for this question and Nicole, I think the ultimate metaverse is actually our brain. Um, my brain is a perfect virtual reality generating uh, machine. I see things, I can touch things, and in my brain everything kind is constituted. So we can definitely learn from the principles of the brain how to actually build a metaverse that feels very much intuitively. I had a discussion with uh, Philip. I asked him, will we spend more time in the, in, in the future in the metaverse than in the, in the physical world? And Philip told me, yeah, I'm not so sure it still feels artificial. I would prefer like my human body. If we could um, create technologies that make the metaverse feel as if I was in my real body, then I think that would be the ultimate metaverse that we uh, try to achieve. And uh, there's a lot of um, hype about the topic of artificial intelligence. We have bets ongoing. Is it another hype, this metaverse topic, or will that be the future? I'm not so sure uh, about how much it is hyped these days. I'm often a little bit underwhelmed when I see the devices that there are. I haven't yet tried the latest ma uh, Magic Leap uh, device, of course. Um, but definitely, I think artificial intelligence will revolutionize the metaverse and uh, gives us the key to actually build a kind of a new world that might be a better world than our physical world these days. Thank you so much. And you know, one of the things that we share, Pascal, is the, the, the thought around many minds creating that one mind that you're speaking about. And so the importance of having many minds contribute to the metaverse is something I'd like to ask you about, Hoda, as well as the technologies to not only build the metaverse, but to be both diverse and inclusive. Can you share with us your thoughts about that? I think it's very important for us that to recognize that there is not one metaverse. And the way we build this technology today would govern how we are going to go forward 
Um, the metaverse is here to disrupt the way we build technology. Number one, it shouldn't be a call of computer scientists or technology developers to develop this technology, but we should create room for uh, social scientists, psychologists, the people who are using this technology to co-develop the technology with the developers. Give them a voice because it's very important for them to add that level of details and be in control of their own digital experience and digital existence. Would that mean that we have to also create a pathway where they are crowd developing the metaverse with the technology developers? Yes, we need to do that from the get-go. Why? Because the metaverse as it is right now, it's based on decentralized, luckily, on decentralized systems. And these decentralized systems are built to make sure that there is a bit of control that exists in the hands of the users control over their own privacy, control over their own economy or economic existence, and control over their own, for example, I mean, um, there was a mention to the digital coin that you could create. So you can create your own money and you can value your own money and you can sell and trade that piece of, of, uh, uh, of value to you within the metaverse. This means that we need to disrupt every way that we are used, using to build this technology. Starting with the crypto that we're building for using this technology, starting as well with the security parameters, starting with um, the approach of development, uh, and be open to do that uh, because it gives voices to everybody within this community, allowing children to create their own metaverse, their own content, so they are safe and secure within it, um, and, not, and allowing uh, also different classes of users to be existing. Thank you so much. So, you know, now that we've talked a bit about how the building blocks, being inclusive in this space, and the communities that will engage in this space, let's t imagine uh, on, the, on this frontier what a day in the life looks like in the metaverse. Peggy, I'd love to hear from you about what the day in the life of an organization or, or a company might look like. What might they get done in the metaverse? So um, actually, I'd like to go to turn to the healthcare industry because we're seeing that right now. It's very tangible right now. Um, so our device is augmented reality. You put it on your eyes. You see your physical world, and we can put digital content in front. So right now, there's a, a, a Munich-based company called Brain Lab, and they were creating digital images of your brain, but you were viewing them on, on what they had at hand, which is a PC. And so it was, while it was a digital image of the brain, you could, you know, it would spin around on the, on the PC. It was still flat <laughs> on the PC. And when Magic Leap uh, launched our first device, they incorporated that software onto Magic Leap. And now doctors would put the device on and they would see the, the Digital, digitized brain in front of them and they could spin it around and they're using it as a training tool. Um, they're using it to, to, to teach new, you know, young medical students about the brain. They're using it themselves to map the surgical pathways they'll take during brain surgery. So ne neurosurgeons are using this ahead of operations. Um, our next-gen device, uh, which is coming out next quarter, is going to be certified to take into the operating room, which means the surgeon can look at the patient's actual brain during surgery and see digital content overlaid. It'll make for a more accurate incision line. Um, they can put a whole variety of screens in front of their eyes um, that will allow them to, without moving their head over to wherever the screen is in the operating room, it'll be in a more comfortable position that, that they can see the patient's vitals. So this is the type of thing that's happening already, and obviously that'll expand into many other enterprises and then into consumer as well. Thank you so much, Peggy, for sharing those really amazing uh, possibilities. So Ed, you know, tomorrow's doctors and, and scientists and researchers will likely... Uh, you know, learn to perform surgery and uh, a lot of different points of education in the metaverse. Uh, you recently, uh, with LEGO, announced a partnership with Epic Games about shaping the future of the metaverse for children. Can you tell us a bit about that? What is the day in the life of a child in the metaverse? Well, I think it's fun and I think it's hugely exciting. And you think about 
the different applications that you could have around the metaverse. I mean, first of all, in the education setting in the classroom, you, know, you think about how learning about volcanoes could be a completely different experience from reading about it to suddenly being transported over a crater as it's erupting and diving down into the volcano to see what's really going on. Or from learning historical dates to being actually at a recreation of an event. So the, the possibilities are endless and, uh, and I think very exciting and a great way to inspire and develop our children. You mentioned our partnership with Epic Games. We're really excited about that. We are at the early days of it. Um, but we're looking forward to creating a space where kids can be empowered with the tools to create, to build, to explore, to socialize, and to have fun in the metaverse. And all that is going to be coupled with some very key principles that we've agreed with Epic, which are integral to the product. Firstly, to safeguard the safety and well-being of kids and families that enter this metaverse, to empower them uh, with their privacy rights, and as well to ensure that they have the choices around data and other aspects of the metaverse that make the experience a really positive one. So we're very excited about it. There's going to be more to come uh, later in the year or, or next year as we, as we develop the product. Thank you so much. Certainly there'll be secondhand impact of children growing up in the metaverse, thinking in new ways and innovating in new ways. Pascal, can you tell me what you see as the day in the life of an innovator, possibly these new innovators in the metaverse? Well, I'm very much looking forward to a metaverse where science is actually conducted in. I think the way we do science these days is rather antique. I have to read like scientific papers until I'm like 64 years old, <laughs> until I, and then I know like 0.1% about brain research, if I'm lucky, and then I would have one year where I can contribute something new to science. So, and then every child has to learn like to start uh, from new. So in the metaverse, I would imagine to have like a perfect scientific assistant, like the Captain Future series, for those who know him, like a flying brain with me. And I don't need to, uh, to, to find solutions because the machines are doing that for me, but I need to ask the right questions. So I think human beings should be there to ask questions, but the machines are way better uh, suited to actually gather this information, maybe also with artificial creativity, form new hypotheses, so I think science will be completely revolutionized in the metaverse. And also, and when I was at gymnasium here in Switzerland, when I studied ancient Greek and Latin, I had to learn which Roman killed which other Roman back in the days. But like in the metaverse, I mean, Wikipedia knowledge is trivial. So the education on the content will be completely different in the metaverse environment. I'm very much looking forward that science get revolutionized through the metaverse. Thank you so much. We talked about, uh, Peggy talked a bit about healthcare, uh, and you talked about science, uh, and, and leaned on to further around education. Uh, so Hoda, what do you see as a day in life for, ac for, for academics? What, is the what are the possibilities about learning in different disciplines uh, in the metaverse? So I think the merit of accumulating knowledge in this world is to have an impact, and to have an impact on progressing the world towards really positive frontiers. Having that type of science accessible, that type of knowledge and development accessible to children and different age groups, I, mean, I don't mean only children, but people who could use the science for impact is the, I would say, is, is the gold mine that we should focus on in the, in, in the educational platforms of the metaverse. Because if you, if you grooved people around purpose, around creating value, around, around solving a problem that would get the world to a better place, then this is what we need to focus on. It's great to use it as a learning material, but also how can we use it as a collaborative place where we are solving a problem, where a child in Africa, for example, is building a solution to, um, to, uh, for a solution of, to build a new ways of building energy, for example, in Asia, for a town in Asia. So, I mean, this kind of interconnectivity of resources and knowledge is what we need to capitalize on to create impact. Thank you so much. So that increased connectivity, you know, Philip, can you tell us what you've seen in Second Life 
in regards to exactly that, how have communities, you know, what's the day in the life of the community? What, what sure. have you seen in Second Life? Yeah, let me, yeah let me, I mean, let me give you a little quick journey, very visual and specific into Second Life. Um, so right now in Second Life, there are about 50,000 people that are logged in. So it would be a bit like the population of a, a medium-sized city in terms of the community who is sort of on the street in the place. Um, and, and the average age, we talked about kids. Well, well, well um, there's a tremendous amount of metaverse-like usage right now in games, uh, games like Minecraft, Fortnite, and Roblox. Those are all kids. The average person in Second Life is closer to about 40 years old, maybe in their mid to late 30s, um, although there are many, many people that are quite a, uh, quite a bit older as well as avatars in Second Life. Um, they use it about four hours a day, so just as a framing. 50,000 people, about four hours when you log in. The typical experience might be you log in in your house, which looks like a beautiful house. You've furnished it yourself. You've, you've, it, it's completely unique. Um, it's your place that you've lived in. The average person has lived in Second Life for about eight years that's in there now, which is quite something. So you might start in your house and walk outside, but your house is in a larger community of houses. So you can look down the street. There are other houses, your friends' houses, that are decorated with their own art and stuff that they've built. You might walk down to the end of the street, and at the end of the street, there's a band stage where there's live music. There's a lot of musicians that actually made it, well, not a lot, but a few so far. Second Life is a million people, not a billion yet, but there are musicians who made it in Second Life. So you walk down the street, you can hear music playing, you walk with maybe a friend, you go into the music venue, there's new people that you haven't met before. You listen to music for a little bit, maybe you leave a tip uh, in the tip jar for the musician. Then you get somebody tells you, let's teleport, I want to show you some art, and you go with them. Maybe this is somebody new you've never met before. You click on the map and you jump to another place that is literally an artwork that is um, a whole space. So it's a field with a wrecked train in it, uh, a, 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 a uh, gosh, what am I thinking of the word, uh, gosh, in a farming field there's a spinning thing, I can't think of it, um, and there's wheat and there's all these strange things for you to explore and together you wander around in this gigantic artwork and have this experience while talking to this new person you met. So four hours goes by quickly, you log off, you're back at your desk um, uh, in front of your computer. So that would be a second life day in the life. Thank you so much, Philip. You know, you mentioned leaving a tip and that leads us to talking about the economy of the, the metaverse. Can you talk about some of the success and that was achieved on the economic end of things uh, and some of the transactions that you saw in the in Second Life. Thanks. Um, so there are hundred, as I said before, there, there are typically in a day's time, there might be a few hundred thousand people that are in Second Life, but a million people if you look at, say, a month. Um, that, the economy of the world is about $650 million U.S., although it's in its own currency, but U.S. equivalent, per year. The average transaction in Second Life is about $2. So it might be for something like a pair of glasses for your avatar, an earring, a piece of furniture for your house, as I mentioned. $2 is the average transaction, um, $650 million a year, so that's about 350 million transactions. More transactions per second, even in Second Life, than the blockchain can handle today. So talk about being early. Uh, we're still quite early. Second Life doesn't use uh, blockchains. The uh, uh, that's the average transaction size, and all over that, that sort of city-sized economy provides a real-world living, you know, a significant enough living to make your way in the real world for probably uh, a few thousand people of those million people. So, you know, maybe that's a good description of the economy. All of the uh, things that you buy and sell in Second Life are uh, coded with who made them and who owns them and if they're for sale and at what price. So Second Life is a kind of a laboratory for many of the things that we hear being talked about in uh, the Web3 stuff, such as NFTs, you know, digital objects that you can own. But uh, yeah. yeah. So to that point, uh, we've started to see NFTs being leveraged to sell real estate in advance in the metaverse. Can you share a bit more about that? What you've seen? Oh, real estate, right. So Second Life, the, the uh, space is about the size of Los Angeles. Uh, all, all together, and it is actually walkable. You know, it is, it's a real city. It has islands that you have to teleport to, but much of it is connected. Um, so real estate in there from the very beginning has been something that you could buy and then sell if you wanted to. Um, uh, 
and so that's a fascinating marketplace. In fact, I was wondering that I was trying to think compared to the very excited sort of NFT stuff that we're seeing going on right now, which is certainly you know at least some kind of a bubble at this moment. Uh, Second Life real estate is much cheaper. You know, the 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 the, the real price of digital goods and of digital spaces is more modest than the real world. So I think one of the promises of, say, uh, land or you know owning property or owning a space in the metaverse is that because, of course, computing is much cheaper to provide the support for that, th those places can be much less expensive than the places in the real world. But yeah, there's a very significant real estate market. I don't know, it's probably a, you know, I don't know, a hundred million dollars a year or something in, in thousands of pieces of land. I, overall, I think Second Life is owned, the land itself is owned by those who wish to actually own land and engage in community building, but it's perhaps uh, 100,000 or so people that own all the real estate there. That's fantastic. And so in order to grow that economy and attract enterprise and, and, other, trans, and other transactions, uh, you wanna have and make sure that there's a, a great deal of security. Hoda, can you speak to what you see in regards to security and keeping these transactions safe? So security is always um, a dynamic evolution of technology. So you need to always, there is not one silver bullet security. So you always build it for the now and you strive to make it better and better. Um, and this is how the community started always. Like you build a piece of security and there is a, a, a crypto analysis or attack measures that are happening against it. And you tend to evolve the security as you go. So the way we build security now um, and integrate it in the different crypto systems or NFT systems is in my opinion, not sustainable for the long run because we need to keep on strive, uh, striving to, to maintain this level of security. And also security is governed by computing power. And I don't know if you attended a few of the sessions yesterday where one of the uh, declarations that came across is by 2025, we will have quantum computing uh, power that is available on commercial aspects. And this is worrisome to me because most of our security that we're building today is, is not going to withstand. 70% of our security that we're having today is not going to withstand quantum computing power. Uh, if it is integrated within, within the crypto world, if it's integrated within the metaverse world, which means that we have the responsibility as a community of, of, of scientists or developers building the security to evolve our, our primitives to be post-quantum resilient or resistance, or to find different courses of improving computing, maybe base our computing on memory-based computing rather than uh, the level of computing that quantum computing will provide. And that's the conversation that we're having at the moment, is also how mindful are we when we are building uh, this technology towards uh, the, the uh, global goals of, uh, of uh, you know, energy uh, and climate, uh, you know, uh, preservations. Because, um, uh, uh, you know, the, um, going forward as well, we need to be mindful of the privacy rights. How can we make sure that we decentralize privacy aspects so you and the metaverse is in full control of your privacy? Full control means full control. It doesn't mean that you have to agree on privacy terms and then have to let go of partial level of control to someone else. And if you can monetize that private data, then you have the c full control and choice of monetizing that private data. And how can we escalate from there to also having this actual um, and authentic realization of different rights? You know, I, I know most of Europe at the moment, they have the GDPR laws, which, uh, which says that you have on a digital space the right to be forgotten and the right not to be analyzed and, the right, um, and different rights. But in reality, in technology, we don't have algorithms that will grant you the right not to be analyzed. So how can you in the metaverse, if you choose to be invisible and I choose to protect your security, then you can do that. No one could analyze you, no one could uh, subject you to AI analytics if that's uh, something that you don't want to be subjected to. And if you want to be invisible or forgotten and have absolutely zero digital, tra uh, digital trace, how can you do that? And this uh, fourth aspect is is that the majority of characters, 
that we're building and avatars that we're building in, in, um, in the metaverse, they're supposed to give you the freedom of representation. So freedom of representation means that if I choose to be someone else, I can do that. But what does it mean in terms of traceability, in terms of um, uh, providing a level of ownership in case of something went wrong? How can you trace that entity or that personality and hold them accountable to the actions that are that they are ha you know that, that they are having on the metaverse uh, ecosystem? So again, Nicole, my bottom line here is we need to really rebuild the ecosystem of technology that we're building in the metaverse. Starting with the computing, starting with the crypto, starting with the different level of algorithms, because we're trying to build an ecosystem that is mindful of the end user, um, you know, um, well-being, and all aspects of what what well-being is defined with. Yeah. Thank you so much. So you talked a bit about you know the well-being of, of the individuals engaging uh, in the metaverse and, and ensuring that they are secure and their privacy is protected. So there are, excuse me, additional transactions that can take place. Peggy, what do you see for the monetization of the metaverse? Is there an app store? Yeah, I think there's, there's absolutely an app store. Um, it'll just be much bigger. <laughs> so for instance, I, I'm very focused on enterprise right now, and I'm looking at the capability of having enterprise applications accessible um, to, to any company who, who logs in to, to the metaverse. One of the applications right now that we're dealing with is um, for factory workers. Uh, there, there's an issue right now where a lot of the um, older f factory workers, as they retire, we're not refilling it with younger factory workers. There's, there's, uh, there's not a, a lot of lure for a young person to go and work in a factory. I think they're, they're more digitally, um, uh, you know, digitally adept and a factory doesn't look very digital to them. And so there are uh, applications that can be worn on the headset, on our augmented reality headset that actually allow that young factory worker to have a digital experience like the older retiring ones would never have had the opportunity to have. And there's companies now that are using it to train the factory workers. So as those older employees retire, the younger ones can actually be come up to speed more quickly by putting the headset on, actually going out onto the factory floor on day one, maybe versus sitting in a classroom for three weeks. Uh, they can walk up to a, a machine and they can be talked through how to maintain that machine by the retired factory worker who, you know, who will be represented in, in a video in their field of view, but they're actually seeing the machine in front of them. They have the use of both of their hands to do whatever needs to be done to maintain that machine. And for the, the company that owns that factory, this brings them a, a shortening a time to productivity. So that factory worker can be put right out on the factory floor and be pr productive from day one versus you know sitting in, in a classroom. Um, so this is the sort of thing that we're, we'll see the monetization of. There'll be a, you know, a pool of applications and then eventually obviously consumer application and lots and lots of entertainment type of applications. But here's something right now that, that there's significant economic value in. Thank you so much, Peggy. So Hoda, you talked, you, know, you talked about security and privacy, and certainly as uh, we engage in additional transactions, uh, be it B2B, B2C, you know, we, we, additionally, there's the continued issues around privacy. So Philip, can you tell us a bit about your perspectives on the metaverse then and now in regards to privacy? Well, at the start, and, and this is somewhat unique to Second Life, we wanted to enable people to have a second life <laughs> And so we presumed, I think, in a way that was a bit different than what we have seen with much of the internet and, and, and some of the metaverse projects today. We presumed that what we wanted to enable people to do, as Hoda said, was to, in, indeed, if they wanted to, and likely they did, create a completely unique identity. And so from the start, we sort of had to balance two concerns. One was protecting their privacy in an extraordinary way, um, because if you think about it, uh, as you can imagine, if you create a new identity for yourself in the metaverse or in, in Second Life, and it, it's, it's a completely different identity, you certainly don't want there to be a breach or an attack 
on the company uh, or on your own data, which would reveal who you are in the real world. There has been much science fiction written about this, but you don't want that to happen. Yet, people only come together and behave in a civil manner when they have a degree of consequence and responsibility attached to their identity. It's easy to do that, of course, with real identity. I mean, everybody can turn in their passports, you know, when they come to the party or something. But, but again, that doesn't provide for that first concern, which is that we should be able to be who we want to be at that moment uh, together with others. So there's this balance that I think we've explored a bit in Second Life and that we're going to have to do broadly, I think, across the metaverse. And in fact, I think some of the interoperability concerns between different worlds of the metaverse must focus on this delicate balance between preserving your identity so that you truly can be someone else if you wish to, but connecting you to other people, to the space, uh, in, in a way that creates responsibility and consequence. Second life is this uh, bit of hope in what has seemed like a largely negative uh, set of interactions between people online. You certainly can, and I think the metaverse can be a tool for this, by putting people together in a shared space where they feel close to each other. I mean, literally, your avatar is close enough that it could reach out and touch someone else, you know, another avatar. Doing that right can enable us to come together as strangers even in public spaces online and get along and get to know each other better and cross over boundaries and be less divisive rather than more polarized so, and, and be more inclusive. Um, so that, uh, that I think is an opportunity, but there are tremendous risks and challenges that we do it right. Balancing security, privacy, freedom of speech, these things are extraordinarily subtle in terms of how we design them, and we're gonna have to do it right. But there is, there is hope. Thank you so much. In finding that balance and responsibility, indeed we're opening up our world and engagement with, with strangers, and children will be engaging with people that, you know, you might not be certain of what age they are and, and what have you. We've seen the impact of online bullying. Ed, can you tell us about your view of how do we how do we keep children safe in the metaverse? Yeah, uh, before we keep children safe, we've got to make sure that we build fun and engaging experiences and online playgrounds. If we don't do that, kids won't show up. So we've got to make sure that it's a fun place to be and an exciting place to be. But in addition, of course, you know, now we're at the beginning of the metaverse, we must learn from our mistakes. We did make mistakes in Internet 2.0, and we've got to make sure that safety is a key part of what we do. But beyond safety, and I really ask technology companies, governments, policymakers, society, to think beyond safety, to consider children's well-being as well. You know, without safety, you can't have well-being, but safety is not a guarantee of well-being. So we, building on some research that Professor Sonia Livingston did in the Digital Futures Commission in the UK, have uh, been involved in a research project and Hoda's institution, Hoda herself has been involved in this as well, called RITEC. It's the Responsible Innovation of Technology for Children. And we're looking into and trying to define what well-being looks like online for children. And we had conversations with over 300 kids across 13 different and very diverse markets to get their insights on well-being. And we asked them what well-being was about. And there was extraordinary commonality wherever you went. Well-being meant physical well-being. It meant went mental well-being. It meant social well-being. And what came through on social well-being was children's need to feel loved, to be loved by parents, by family, by friendships. And also, it was about um, self-worth, feeling that they were really positive about themselves. And from there, we asked the kids, what did they want to see in online experiences? And they wanted positive social connections. They wanted the opportunity to be creative. They wanted to see diversity, equity, and inclusion in their online experiences. That being about, was the technology attainable for them, but also did they feel represented in the experiences that they were enjoying? And so from there, we are developing with the research institutions 
indicators of well-being that we think that designers need to have in mind as they put in place and they build this metaverse. And it's with thought like that, very deliberate thought at the outset that we're going to get to a more positive place for children in the metaverse. And I think that's what was missing in Internet 2.0. And we should all learn from that and make sure that we're moving forward in the right way for 3.0. Thank you so much. So we've had a great picture you know, that paints the future of the metaverse. So what I'd like to ask each of you, in 30, or second, 30 seconds or less, what is your audacious goal for the metaverse? 30 seconds or less. Coda? Inclusive, disruptive technology build, I would say. We shouldn't build the metaverse based on legacy systems, but we should disrupt the way we build the technology across borders. Yeah, I, I, as you can imagine, I would say that it would be that in 10 years' time or so, we can look back and say that remarkably enough, <laughs> we actually found a way to use the internet to come together, to, to get along with each other, resolve our differences, resolve disputes, solve geopolitical problems uh, together in a, in a virtual space. And I'd say I think it can help us have more fulsome communications and meetings. I think meetings will come to life. They'll not be on our flat Zoom screen that we're so tired of. <laughs> You'll actually be able to see people virtually in front of you, and maybe we'll travel a little bit less. <laughs> Thank you. Pascal? I wish that the metaverse will help us uh, catapult science so that we can accelerate science, that we can build human-level artificial intelligence, and with that we can create a golden age for humankind. Thank you. Hey. An inspiring, fun, engaging environment for children with their safety and well-being at its very core. And I think that's audacious, but I think it's achievable. Thank you so much. We've heard from this amazing panel, and now we'd like to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Your question. Thank you so much for how you conducted it and also the variety of views. Uh, one problem that I've identified or that it, you, you've touched upon is actually the balance between the physical and the digital because we're moving more and more towards the digital um, and, and more accelerated and as you say, children will be completely immersive. So how do we teach them to have that connection that we grew up with? Um, and uh, I, I, I am interested in the research that you said you're doing in the UK. I'm UK based. And actually, I was here launching two days ago an initiative to reestablish handwriting into the mainstream worldwide because even ourselves, we've blurred this and there's no space uh, in our daily lives where we don't have screens any day. So I think uh, researchers and or conversations should also question that now that you are in the leading forefront of that. And I hope that yes, just as much I say, as we advance in being digitally literate, we shouldn't become humanly illiterate. So I also would like you to uh, invite you to take on handwriting and perhaps participate in the project. Um, and also to pass on to the children. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, would you like yeah, to start with that? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm Johanna Suleta, yes, and I'd like to know what are you doing regarding that? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I mean, the LEGO group is, we're celebrating our 90th birthday uh, this year, and we're having a, a good party about it um, in the coming weeks. And of course, at our core, we're a physical toy company, and that's not going away. The LEGO brick the Lego system of play, much loved, and is our focus. Um, but actually, the, the separation of physical and digital is something that I think we think about as adults. But if you talk to kids today, they don't really see it that way. It's a very seamless experience for them between both online and offline worlds. And so, um, in our view and in our opinion, you've got to have offerings in both space. Um, the brick isn't going away. The unlimited possibilities of the Lego brick is here to stay. But we believe we can enhance it through online experiences. We've dabbled in this and, and got some significant online offerings. Um, 
but I think that the metaverse provides new opportunities. So I completely understand what you're saying. And um, as a parent, I'm also concerned about good things like picking up physical books and obviously playing with Lego bricks, which my kids do quite a lot. Um, but I think that we are have to be cognizant of the fact that um, kids want to be online as well, and it's where they can get new dimensions of possibilities in play. Well, Peggy, you talk a lot about mixed reality. Can you share more about that? And yeah. Find that balance and blend? I think the opportunity for the metaverse in the context of children is right now, kids are looking down at their screens. They're fully immersed in this other area, this digital area. They're, oftentimes, they're disengaged from their physical world. And the opportunity is for them to have a heads-up view again, to enter their, <laughs> or to come back to their physical world and have digital content interspersed in that, in that digital world. So maybe they're playing Legos physically, um, but up in the corner of their field of view, um, you know, a friend is, is chatting with them. And, and so it's this type of mixed reality uh, world that, that is possible with the metaverse. I don't actually think it'll be possible until we can get these devices into glasses formats. So you, you hear many, many companies are working hard on, on making them smaller. The current state of the technology is such that it looks a bit like what, where we're at, which is kind of a goggles format. But when they can be super lightweight and you just put them on in the morning the same way that you pick up your mobile phone in the morning, that's when I think you're really going to see the, the potential there. You, we might want to note or just add technically that a good thing that's happening right now, whether it's Magic Leap or uh, the Oculus Quest, for example, these latest devices can track the hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, they actually use AI to do that effectively. It, it was terrible a few years ago. So there's something coming together, which is all these devices have cameras. Even our own computers post-COVID have more cameras on them. And we can track the hands. So that, imagine a child being able to draw, at least in the air, quite accurately. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're, we are, we, well, we are seeing that. There are, there are any number of applications, if you've not tried them now, with the new VR devices that do allow that kind of uh, rich embodiment, use of the hands. And most importantly here, you could see from the points of view of my colleagues in the panel that there is an escalation of how we build the technology to provide this kind of mixed, mixed reality that we are building. And at the same time, we are trying to build this reality where children are not consumers of the technology, but they're also developers of the technology. And soon they would be building their own metaverse. And hopefully they will be shocked by how it would look like from a child perspective. Yeah. Well, just talking about the handwriting, I have a horrible handwriting, but I learned that the, the largest part of the brain is actually uh, for controlling your physical body. So I feel that these days the virtual reality technology is uh, heavily focused on the eyes, a little bit on like, your hand, but uh, if children uh, spend too much time deprived from sensory input, I don't think that's a good thing. So um, until the metaverse is there where it should be, I would rather send my child into the forest, get the hands dirty and swimming in the lakes, than to spend too much time in the virtual reality. Thank you so much. And thank you for your question. Uh, this gentleman here. Yes. Good to get your opinion on what is the fundamental problem metaverse will solve or what is the fundamental benefit we can expect because there's a lot of promises in theory, but what is the fundamental promise today we are solving, whether it's a commercial problem or a health problem or a social problem, or what are the fundamental benefits we can expect? Well, that would be a question for me, yeah. <laughs> I think the metaverse is the place where people can collaborate uh, with each other and where people can actually meet each other rather uh, uh, easily. Imagine a, a virtual, for example, science lab, artificial intelligence lab, where one million scientists around the globe can actually collaborate together, we could tremendously accelerate science. So I think one of the largest impacts of the metaverse will be on science and scientific discovery. I think that alone is already worth to pursue the metaverse technology as heavily as we can. Philip? I think a practical example that ha happens in Second Life, it's definitely happening with the, these first generation VR devices, is school. I, I, if you could bring a teacher to your school that was an Egyptologist, that was an expert in a specific Egyptian tomb, and she could take your kids in the school into the tomb 
and show them the, you know, everything about it and spend an hour doing that. And then that same teacher could move on to a school somewhere far away and, you know, do, do that her whole day. I mean, that's just a huge uh, move forward for humanity because of the equality that it brings, for example, to education. Any teacher can be brought to any student. And also, it's, it's about removing barriers to accessibility of resources. If you think of it today, if you need to access a specific scientific resources or education resources, you need to have specific level of collaboration and partnerships and agreements in order to get to there. Maybe the metaverse could be your seamless environment where you, ha where you will have accessibility multitude of resources to build the impact and accelerate the impact that you want to go with. But my question right now is we need to be mindful to the fact that this is only applicable to 60% of people around the globe who are digitally connected. How can we build this technology where it is going to be viral in terms of impact to also bring along the 40% who are not digitally connected? Because sharing this resource and being able to build a technology where it it gives back to this 40% who are not digitally connected is very important as well. Yeah, certainly COVID brought up the digital divide. Peggy, did you want to add something? Well, I just think it has the potential to augment human potential. You know, you can think of it as a tool that helps you do whatever you're doing uh, faster, quicker, you're more informed, a little bit like what it was pre search engine and post search engine you know we used to have to get out encyclopedias and look things up go to the library and, and now it's just so easy to to do a quick search it'll be that same sort of tool that'll augment you know whatever you're doing bring it to a higher potential okay i'd love to take another question lovely lady, uh, my apologies lady in the front please Hi, so uh, I totally agree with you that we need to ensure security and privacy in the metaverses and also that they are built to be inclusive and diverse. But my question is, who are we and who do we, how do we ensure that we are aligned and agree across the metaverses? That's a great question. Uh, I think from the terms of governance, we need to find a way, as Philip said earlier, to find a governance structure that does not disrupt the freedom uh, ecosystem that you're trying to build here. Does it exist right now? We don't know, like, who are we? What do we want to do? How do we want to contribute? The ecosystem is supposed to be mindful and respectful of everybody's right to exist on the metaverse, but at the same time, build a level of um, ownership to malicious activities. In my opinion, there should be a way where we can build anomalies of malicious activities, for example, and you know, stop them prior to them having uh, a, you know, a catastrophic ramification on the other users on the network. Yeah, you know, I think it has to be a mix of uh, many voices in order to, to solve this one. From a, I'm an engineer from a technical standpoint, I'm trying to be as open and transparent about what these devices can do so that society can understand why they need to be, uh, have a certain amount of regulation around them. For instance, we have about five, cam five uh, inward facing cameras on your eyes because we need, we need to know where your eyes are gazing in order to place the digital content. And then there's four outward cameras that are trying to re map your world. And so that's a lot of sensors. It's much more than our mobile phones. And so we have to ensure that everyone understands what these devices are capable of in the same way we needed to understand artificial intelligence and what those algorithms are, are capable of doing and the biases they might introduce or, or not. So it's, it's incumbent upon technologists uh, to not just create good technology and unleash it on the world, but to also carry the responsibility of uh, uh, containing and controlling that technology, you know, hopefully without suppressing innovation, but making it a safe place and useful for everyone. Well, uh, let me just add something, you know, maybe interesting on that. Well, th th this first generation of the internet that we obviously collectively have a lot of problems with, especially right now, 
uh, relies on, uh, we have no identity there. You are anonymous when you go everywhere on the internet. It is, it is exceptionally unusual on the internet that you have an identity at all. Now, you might then say, well, to make this new thing work, we're gonna go government ID, right? But I think a more modern and philosophical thought about identity, about we, if you will, is that we, our identity, our individual identities are constructed by the local communities which are multiple and overlapping that we're members of. And so my suspicion is that we will, through a mix of new decentralized stuff and some of the things we've already learned, we'll come up with a way for you to identify yourself to become part of we through connections with others through many connections with others, affiliations with groups. So I think if this starts from the bottom up and is polycentric, you are a member of multiple groups, I think we'll end up with something that, as I said before, balances that, that need for freedom with an adequate membership in society. That'd be great. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a great question about governance and one that we've, uh, I've been involved in several discussions this week on. And we need to get there quick. We need to get to a global consensus on what are the design principles we want to see go into the metaverse. And there's so many different questions. How do we do things like age verification online? What impact, what do we know and what impact and what research are we doing on the impact of hardware on young people, um, whether through their ocular vision or through neural elasticity? All these questions are things that we need to understand and understand pretty quickly um, because we know the rate of innovation is very, very high. So um, we've got to get to that global consensus. I think that um, this week is, I've certainly heard some really positive and strong words about doing that and the transparency that people like Peggy is committing to is, is incredibly positive. So that's what we want to see across industry and across uh, government as well. Just like a short, a short answer, I have to give. I think you're hitting at the weak spot. We have no solution to that. I do not believe that we can ease, uh, to reach so easily a global consensus when I look at human nature these days. We didn't do a good job when it came to ethics. I mean, there are basic like questions like human rights, for example. Even there, we don't have a consensus. So I would imagine that a consensus for the virtual world might be a little bit more uh, tough to get. So I think we don't have yet a good solution to your question. Fair point. We'll go to this side of the room. Uh, in the front. Lady in the front there. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Verena. I would like to share an observation and also raise a question. So first of all, I would like to mention that I feel extremely humble and uh, deeply impressed being able to be here live in this room with you. Um, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to touch you, but... Uh, um, I think this is the, the vibe and let's say this experience being here is something I assume is very hard to be replicated in a digital world in the metaverse. But I, yeah, maybe I can still see that in the course of the upcoming years. I would be surprised though. <laughs> now to my question. Um, Ed, you mentioned this amazing application of the importance of creating safe spaces for children in order to learn, to have a fun place. Amazing opportunities I could see here. And Peggy, you mentioned this uh, applications in healthcare uh, in relation to augmented reality supporting surgeons, also another topic very close to my heart and I can't wait to see more of these things to be put in practice. Now to my question, I don't wanna play the devil's advocate, but what about the risks involved? So where I'm heading to is thinking about the current stage of the internet as I know it, and you probably know a bit more about that. I think about fake news. I think about deep fake videos, something I consider very fascinating from a scientific or artificial intelligence point of view, but also at the same time it gives me shivers about what could go wrong, what about all the detrimental applications that are out there. So don't get me wrong, I mean I'm really looking forward to see all these amazing opportunities, but how can we tackle the risks and what needs to be done there to be able to ensure that the metaverse will be truly an enriching experience for everyone. I think that's a very good question. What's your name again? Verena. Verena, I think this is why we started the session by saying the way we build the metaverse and the underlying technology need to change. 
because these legacy systems that we build the technology based on, they allow for fake news to exist, they allow for this kind of misrepresentation of identities, misrepresentation of facts, and this is why we are suffering at the moment. So how can we fact check, fact check all of these representation that exist in the metaverse, allow the users to, for example, yesterday in one of the sessions, someone said that there should be an alert button where you can exist, uh, where it can exit your virtual reality. If you choose to, if, if you were overwhelmed with the information or overwhelmed with the, with, the, with the truth of information that you are being represented with. So at the moment, we're still trying to build solution for these kind of problems because they cannot exist in a metaverse and should not exist in a metaverse reality. The, for the high risk that they have and the implication of on the well-being, on building biases, on building specific polarization actions um, uh, in this space. So it's an open problem. We need to still resolve it. Philip? Well, I, I could perhaps give a specific... Well, one thing I wanted to say, I agree with you that the the face-to-face -face experience is very subtle and very hard to capture, and we're not even close yet. So we're still giving you a telephone to communicate, you know, if, in a sense. We're certainly not yet bringing you face-to-face. -face. We brought the lights up as we began these questions. I love that. Uh, that was well done by our, uh, our organizers, of course, because it's very important, because it changes the nature of the interaction that we have when I can see your face when you're asking the question to me. So it's an example of how technology, you know, is, still has some steep hills to climb to put us together. I would say a risk, I'll give a risk <laughs> as, a, as a participant in all this stuff. Um, if we use AI to create fake people, and then we mostly interact when we go online with fake people, not with real people, we're gonna be making a terrible, terrible mistake. And there's gonna be an enormous temptation to do that because AIs will give us nicer versions of all our friends. How terrifying, right? You could have an AI that is your mom and dad, only they're much nicer to you. That isn't any good, we don't want that, right? I think a key measure of success in, in, in going after these risks is are we bringing ourselves together or are we bringing ourselves more apart? And when we look back at a day in our lives online, the, I think the most important diagnostic question to say, are we making the right kind of progress is, are we spending more time with each other or less time with each other? And unfortunately right now I think in, some, in many ways we're spending less real time with each other when we're online. I would never dare to contradict Philip. I'm a big fan of <laughs> Philip uh, in a public setting, but I think I need to. I think it would be an, an awesome product to have like the perfect uh, human being in front of you, designed by means of human engineers or AI, I don't care. I just want to have like a super duper interesting person in front of me. So why do you think uh, people would not buy such a product to have the perfect girlfriend, the perfect actor? I think that would be an amazing product, don't you think? Well, don't you think, though, that the risk, no. the, the risk of manipulating each other, if I, if I, if I uh, adopt that virtual friend, <laughs> how do I know that virtual friend isn't manipulating my behavior? You tell me, from, from your extensive experience with the mind and AI, will AIs be able to manipulate our behavior? You know, definitely, but well, actually human beings are also able to manipulate right, my behavior. You can do so. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my, my Tesla that I'm driving, I mean, uh, I'm completely dependent on that uh, car, and I don't think it was a good invention for, for the planet, but I still drive it because it's very comfortable. I don't need to drive on my own. It can be manipulated where I drive to. I take that risk because the positive benefits outweigh my risks. So, but we maybe we continue the conversation afterwards. Yeah, yeah I, I'd, li I think I'd like to join that conversation okay. as well, Pascal. <laughs> I have some issues with trying to create the perfect person and particularly what impact that might have with people's self-worth offline. So I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's very important to take this conversa conversation to the metaverse. We should allow both ideologies to exist in the metaverse, but at the same time, give the user the full information about the ramification of having these two both ideologies, like having real people versus having perfect uh, AI-based structures. And people need to know the impact of this exposure. Like, I should recognize that this is a full AI built uh, human being or, or, or virtual digital being, 
and what kind of ramifications in terms of security, in terms of well-being, that would also introduce on my interaction. So I think give people choice is the best thing that we can have here on the metaverse. Thank you for that question sparking, you know, exactly why we're here to hear these different perspectives. With that, I'd like to take another question from the audience. Uh, we have about the fourth row back, the woman in the white and black. My name is Magdalena, and I agree that we need to, as a global community, look at the implications of all this technology, right? And do we really want it? What do we want and what we don't want? But I want to go back to Mr. Kaufman, because you brought up, on one hand, you're kind of skeptical and saying, oh, you're underwhelmed. But on the other hand, you're talking about building human-level AI. And so can you describe how you're going to use the metaverse to develop human-level AI? Well, um, when I'm in my physical lab here in Zurich, I'm often stuck because I have to order like batteries or motors and I have to wait for three weeks and because of the supply chains, the crash, I have to wait for months. But if I was in a virtual artificial intelligence lab, I can order that battery instantly. And also sometimes I have like really stupid problems and I'm sure some scientists in the world would say, hey, Pascal, it's so easy to solve, you should do it like that. So I think uh, uh, that way we can reduce hurdles and we can definitely accelerate science by having this perfect AI lab, so to speak, in the metaverse, yeah. Okay, well, we'll take another question from the gentleman yeah. in the front. Blue jacket. <laughs> Jeff Richards, AO Foundation, so on the healthcare issue, so I, I particularly to Peggy on this. We teach with courses, we teach with models, we teach with cadavers, we're moving into the virtual reality. We teach 60,000 trauma surgeons every year how to operate. So where you have an advantage, it's easy to model a bone, it's easy to model vascular system, nervous system, model the immune system. You can't model that, but the metaverse could. This will help diseases, this will help everything all over the world, that's one. The second point, that's education, that's fine. Then you come to actual surgery, you can have a virtual body in the actual body of the person you're operating on. And with Marcus, you can know where the implant is. You can reduce x-rays. You can make it much more accurate. So it's not just education. It's perfecting in surgery. And I see this as a massive benefit of the metaverse. Just to follow on to that, I think we'll look back and say, remember when surgery was done without... <laughs> without digital augmentation. And, and it's like when we had cars and didn't have seat belts, you know, no, that, that will be how it'll feel to us. And like, I, I just on that, another example, there's an interesting company that is doing um, heart catheterization. And they used to, the surgeons used to insert the catheter by looking at a, you know, a PC in front of them. And, you know, it's hard to visualize, or cognitively, it's hard to visualize something on a flat screen. But this company has taken the heart, the live heart from the patient real time and mapped it and put it in front of the surgeon. And so now they're putting the catheter into the heart with much higher accuracy and navigation and, and less fault and better outcomes. So I think we will look back and say, wow, how could we ever have gone into the operating room without it? <laughs> And I also, it would govern the way we manufacture solutions for this problem. Can you imagine uh, how it would give you an insight to develop, for example, a customized, precise models of the valves that need to be implanted in the hearts of every single individual, rather than just having a generic model that you need to replace in a few years? Yeah. Okay. And I'd like to take another question. Second row. Thank you. So um, I understand that the metaverse is not going to solve the, or bridge the digital divide yet. But for those who are, uh, have access to it, yes, there is, in my opinion, also a, a big uh, issue here. And that is escaping reality. And it's issues, it's, it's problems, and not dealing with it. For example, I'm in the metaverse, contemplating and enjoying my sexy self, uh, modeling and, and, of course, dancing and partying uh, all along. However, I'm not perfecting my real self. I'm not exercising and so on and so forth with all the consequences. And also, uh, yeah, I, I may solve all these problems. I do not know if this illusion of interacting with the perfect perfect person is going to m improve myself as well. So the question is, 
Speaking of the second life, yes, obviously, it's, it's addressed to you as well as to Mr. Kaufman. Um, again, I hope you will disagree, maybe. Uh, but this second life is addictive. And uh, I mean, I know it because I love it. So um, how about the negative consequences? You know, if I could just add something sort of from the world of second life, uh, w while I agree uh, that our uh, removing ourselves from being embodied in our physical bodies in the real world is certainly certainly has risks. I was thinking you were going to say that we, you know, leave behind basic problems of the real world that we're discussing, for example, at this conference, you know, such as, you know, conflict, food supply, our bodies in the real world, taking care of, uh, of all of us. Um, but one thing I wanted to say about Second Life that's quite interesting. When people create avatars in Second Life, curiously enough, and there have been a large number of academic papers now written on this, they actually tend to improve similar aspects of their real life. So for example, if people have an avatar that's very fit and dancing all the time, they find themselves dancing more in their real life. Uh, this is something that is not, I'm not asserting it as an anecdote. It, it's been studied a lot. Um, so there's a bunch of physical, it, it has something to do, perhaps Pascal could, could, could describe it more. It has something to do with our minds seeing, an, seeing a version of ourselves that we then use as like a, a target. We, 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 you know, by demonstrating where we want to be, we then go there with our real uh, yeah. body. And that, that, that must be a, a brain thing. Yeah, the, the same as when you're dreaming, actually. You're also kind of exercising your activities. So it's uh, training that you're doing, can do in, in virtual world. And just to add to your addiction question, if you build technology that is not addictive, maybe the technology is bad. So I think <laughs> you need to build addictive technology so that it's actually useful. Chocolate is very addictive. I love chocolate but there are adverse effects to chocolate. So therefore, I think whenever you're building an awesome product, it gets addictive. Yeah. Yes, we have uh, time for just one more question. I'd like to get to this side. Hi, uh, my name is Aisha, I'm from Nigeria. So my question is, I'm not sure there's an answer, but I do recall you, sh you mentioned that um, the metaverse has really been engineered around those on the positive side of a digital divide. So are there are there opportunities, are there companies right now looking at those in the 40% and figuring out problems, figuring out opportunities for them in the metaverse right now? I think uh, throughout the discourse that we have on this forum, we have established that how difficult it is to access the 40%, but it's our collective responsibility to find pathways when we build the technology to give back to the 40%. And I think yesterday in one of the sessions, someone talked about making this technology lightweight so it can exist on any level of device and through interoperability. And in this sense, maybe it would be available on cheaper choices, much more cost-effective choices. So this is number one. And number two, maybe we could dictate on the technology makers somehow they use the circularity concept to recycle the devices that are, because you need, uh, devices go through specific value chain within the ecosystem of the metaverse. How can we recycle old, old you know, uh, consoles that we are using? Maybe you should send it across uh, through a one marketplace platform to people within the 40% and make it a mandate for these companies to share these kind of obsolete devices or maybe uh, give back some of the, you know, not only obsolete devices, but devices that you design for the 40%. Allow the community within the metaverse maybe to use part of their economic value that exists to fund devices or to fund for accessibility for the 40%. But all of these initiatives are supposed to be put there by design from the get-go, from now. We have collective responsibility to say that we don't just want to be commercially available, we want to be impactful in terms of this availability. Philip? First, an agreement and an observation, and it might be a bit, bit controversial amongst some of the technologists, but we have no hope of providing value to that, to, to, to that 40 percent of people in the next 10 years unless we deliver these experiences, whatever it is we're talking about, over smartphones. I mean, it seems that at least, say, in the next decade, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to get to, to give anything worldwide that provides help using anything but smartphones. So that would be an observation. 
The second statement, though, I think the opportunity is that um, if we are able to uh, deploy interactive experiences in which people really can both make and communicate with each other, you know, from wherever they are, then we, un then we certainly must have this opportunity to unlock creativity for, for people to deliver to people all over the world their own unique experiences and capabilities. I think that that is definitely an opportunity that the internet has not yet given us. The internet has mostly been a one-to-many broadcasting thing, right, so far. But if we reverse that and we allow people to build and talk and be creative in the right way, like we've been talking about, then, then we do have this huge opportunity. But I think in the near term, we have to go by smartphones. The last thing I would say is this. I was sitting here thinking at the conference about this. The amount of money that we've printed, deployed, put to work worldwide uh, in response to COVID, right, has been in the trillions. It is interesting to observe that though the technology that we have arrayed, this new stuff like the Magic Leap, is not cheap. We actually have spent more in response to COVID than it would take to give every living human being uh, technology of the sort that we're talking about. So this new advanced technology, we've actually spent that much in the last couple of years. So we could do it. Thank you, Philip. So this amazing discussion is coming to a close. I'd like to thank the community here and online for sharing your voices and adding to this really important conversation. And in that, you've been sharing your voices with the world via this forum. So for a last word, in five words or less to the panel, what are the key things that you have taken away that make you hopeful for the possibilities of the metaverse? Hoda? The fact that it's an inclusive, open system. That's it. Philip? Uh, that we as humans are biased toward cooperation. That we'll be able to augment human potential. Not all questions are solved yet, so I think that's potential also for the metaverse. The willingness for well-being, and I was, if I may say, sorry, it's a few extra words, very inspired, sir, by your projection on immunity. Um, as a father of a son with an autoimmune disease, that gives me great hope for what we can achieve through the metaverse going forward. Thank you so much. I'd love you to uh, thank the uh, panel with some applause and yourselves.